this is the sixth in a series on the Jewish Gentile controversy. And if you remember from past uh, sessions, we are focusing on a verse in Acts 15 5, which we're going to study today, where it says that the certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees, who were believers, said to a assembled the Jew, a, a church assembly, and it was the leaders in Jerusalem, it was the apostles and the elders, and said to them, the Gentiles that are coming to Christ, you must have them circumcised, and they must keep the law of Moses. That's what we're going to study today, and I'm very excited about it. We've set up in prior sessions, done some prep work to kind of get into the mind and the heart of this issue and of the people of the time and what it was to be a Jew and think like a Jew and what it was to be a Gentile and what had been said in the old uh, scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. And we've also talked about the, uh, the events that led up to this event that were mind-boggling, cha world-changing events. But now we're at Acts 15. And Acts 15 is a watershed event. After all, never before has the church met together to discuss something publicly as they did this issue. It is certainly unique. And, you know, if they hadn't gotten over this hump, uh, everything could have been shut down. The advance on the Jewish world was progressing quite nicely. Jews were coming to Christ all over the world. But Gentiles, well, that was another thing that was just starting to take off. And it was just about ready, if the church didn't do something, to become derailed. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pick up and we're going to read this whole chapter. So hold on to your seat belts. I'm looking at Acts 15. Now, just back up two verses. Paul had just come back from his very first apostolic missionary journey. Uh, he'd been sent out by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had specifically commissioned him and Barnabas to go on the work that he had set aside. And as you know, they went to every synagogue. They went to the Jew first. And as they received pushback in each city in this area of the world, um, they would then say, okay, we're going to the Gentiles. So essentially what they did is they planted churches. They were mixes of people. There were Jews in those churches. There were people who had been what Luke refers to as God-fearing Gentiles or Greeks. In other words, they weren't really converted to the Jewish faith. They weren't 100 per, they weren't circumcised. They weren't 100% Torah compliant, but they hung in with the Jewish people on their synagogue. Uh, they, they were supportive of the Jewish way. They were respectful of the Jewish way of life. They came as students of the Jewish way of life, and they participated in a synagogue liturgy. And then there was just Gentiles, just raw Gentiles. <laughs> so anyway, in every city... It names the cities and it goes through them in the previous few chapters and it says that there is a community, a community that follows Jesus in each place where Paul went. So he comes back and he reports back to Antioch where they were sent out and on arriving there, this is 1427, on arriving there in Antioch, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And here we go, verse 15, next verse, chapter 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. Well, you know, you got teachers in Antioch, right? So these guys are pretty confident, and they come right from Judea, the mother church, as it were. And here's what they say. They were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Oh my God. 
Antiochus. Now, Antioch's already got a church with several Gentiles in it. And Paul has just established a bunch of churches with Gentiles in it. For the first time. I mean, really, before now, yes, we had the incident with Cornelius, but there's a silence after Cornelius. It's as if, but now it's right in front of the church's eyes, right in Jerusalem. It's, you know, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so this brought Paul and Barnabas at Antioch into sharp dispute and debate with them. Those are very, very powerful words. There's a lot of emotion in those words. Don't gloss over them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. And this news made all the brothers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> so far, so good. Then some of the believers, underscore believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, and this is the verse that I've been quoting in every series, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Now let me say something about Pharisees. Oftentimes, us 20th century evangelical Christians have a very bad idea. If you say the word Pharisee, the first thing that comes to our mind is hypocrisy, legalism. I don't think that's fair. Were there certain ones that were legalistic or, as you might say, um, hypocritical? Well, of course they were. And guess what? There are in all of our churches, regardless of what movement or denomination you are. There are those that are, that do things outwardly but it's not really from the heart. That's, well, not to excuse it, but that's human nature. But there were honest, genuine, sincere, fervent, devoted, dedicated Pharisees. Believers. Yes, believers. Part of the church. Not just part of the church, but as it's clear from the context, they were part of the leadership of the church. What does Pharisee mean? Pharisee, it was a term that came about, uh, if I understand right, I'm not a great historian, but it came about during the time that, um, in between the Testaments, that 400 years between the Testaments, it was a movement of Jews who said, we got to get back to the Torah. we got to rediscover and live authentically our identity is Jews. we got to take this thing seriously. All the woes that have come upon us as a nation is because we haven't done this and we got to do it. And so they devoted themselves to study, to contemplation of the Torah, to teaching the Torah. And they devoted themselves to keeping the Torah. And when I say Torah, I mean the law of Moses. And uh, they devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to tithing. They devoted themselves to uh, the festivals. They, did, they devoted themselves to many things that were prescribed in the law. So the term means, actually means in its origin, separatists. They wanted to separate themselves from everything unclean, the contamination of the world, certainly that includes Gentiles and Gentiles' ways of living, and they wanted to be pure. Pure ones, you could say. Did Jesus have a problem with that? Well, yes and no, because there's certain things that often come with that in human nature. One is hypocrisy, the other is not being truthful, authentic, uh, not being humble, uh, you name it. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, some of these harshest words 
were against the Pharisees. But nonetheless, he loved the Pharisees. He went into the homes of some of the Pharisees and read in the Gospels. Some of his most devout converts, including Saul or Paul, were from the sect of the Pharisees. Nicodemus was of the Pharisees. Joseph Arimathea, I believe, who buried him, or provided his burial route, was of the Pharisees. To be a Pharisee, well, is a good thing, in a way. I mean, it's a good thing. Yes, it has its Achilles heel, but it's not consistently a bad thing. And it was not consistently a bad thing at this time of this writing. It was a good thing. So you have certain ones who are really devout, uh, really devout to this. I mean, they're given their all to it, who rise up and say, ah, Paul, ah, Paul, no, you can't do this, no, no, no. And they had their arguments. They had their reasons. So the church decided, let's see, how does it, let me just go back here. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said they must be circumcised. They're required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met together to consider this question. Keep the question before you. Don't add to it. The question. What's the question? Well, the Gentiles either have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. They go together. Or they don't. It's either God's will for them to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, or it's not. There's various spins you can take on this. But let's not go there. Let's stick to the simple question. Is this God's will, or is it not God's will? So after much discussion, verse 7, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the good news and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you test God? by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers had been able to bear. No, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Well, I told you, this Cornelius incident, if I was a Jew, it would have given me a headache. I wouldn't know how to wrap my mind around that. And here he is bringing it up again. No. Not much has changed. God left a testimony. He deposited something into the Jewish church, and he got everybody's attention. But had they gone out and converted Gentiles? No, not really. Not up till this time. And this time, it's coming right home to roost through a man, strangely enough, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, one of the strictest of Jews, one of the most accomplished, righteous of Jews that ever have been, one of the most disciplined, exemplary Jews that the Jewish faith ever produced. And he did violence to the church. He tore the church up. He was a church shredder of the 99th degree. And then got saved. So here he is now, turning around, and he's not only converting Jews to Christ in all of the dispersia, but he's also, and especially, converting Gentiles. So, how does this work? How does this work? How does this work? Had the prophets laid out how this would work? I'm not aware of it. They simply said the Gentiles are going to come in. Many nations would join the Jewish people in the last times. And through the Messiah, people would rally to, to, to both the Jews and to the Messiah, to the land, to the temple. I mean, various ways it's framed, but they'd be together, Jew and Gentile. 
nations, many nations would join themselves. What does that mean? What does that look like? We've always been separate. We've always been the chosen ones, Gentiles. What does this look like? Well, that Cornelius episode, it would be nice to just forget about. Just flush it. Just, let's hope it just kind of goes away. <laughs> but the apostles couldn't let it go. The church leadership couldn't let it go. God had given the Great Commission and included somehow the Gentiles. So what are they going to do? Well, Peter reminds them of Cornelius. Verse 12, the whole assembly became silent. You just see the wheel. You can feel the wheels turning. Probably many headaches. <laughs> they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, James spoke up. Now this James is not the Apostle James. He'd already been martyred. This is James, who is a relative of Jesus. He, became, he came to headship in the church, very, Jerusalem church, very early. Tradition has it that he was the bishop or head of the Jerusalem church. And that seems to be the case as you read his name throughout Acts and even Galatians, different places in the Bible. He was like, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't tagged like Peter was tagged, but... Functionally and practically, he was very high up in the church leadership because the saints respected him greatly. So he stood up and he said, James spoke up, said, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. As far as I know, it's just Cornelius' household pretty well. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it's written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things that have been known for ages. Now, this passage is a quotation from the Septuagint translation from Amos, Amos 9, I believe. And you say, what's this tent of David? The tent of David was something that David rigged up between the tabernacle, the Mosaic tabernacle, that for a while was in Shiloh, Shiloh. And apparently the priesthood, and it just got, well, it got, uh, it was moved from that place to another. And David had a tent that he has, he has set up for it. And it, the way it talks, it's if David spent a lot of time before the presence that was over the, ta over the ark and worshipped. And you get the impression that it was more of a, what should I say, less ecclesiastical, more of an informal kind of setup, temporary, maybe not as extravagant as the original tabernacle was. Uh, didn't have all the paraphernalia, didn't have as much of the priesthood. It was maybe parred down. I'm not, you know, the Bible doesn't really talk a lot about it explicitly. But God seemed to be partial to it because he had at one time already when this when Amos spoke, he had a temple. He had Solomon's temple, a structure. So why would he rebuild David's tent? Only conjecture, but God's after something. He's after something here. He loved David. And he loved David's heart. And he loved how David dared to approach him. He loved how David sought him out. He loved how David loved him. <laughs> He's going to rebuild that, he says. And then, at that time, the 
rest of those who are called by God, who are Gentiles, will come to God. So there, there it is. Hmm. Then James goes on to say, verse 19, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Understand. <laughs> If you are a Gentile in the ancient world and you consider the possibility of becoming a devout Jew, that is going through a Jewish conversion, it's to say it's difficult is to put it mildly. I mean, starting with circumcision to the Sabbath to now new festivals, new times, new rituals, different food, not associating with, well, Gentiles, your family, or others. On so many levels, you must embrace as a Jew, if you're going to be converted, the separateness of the Jewish religion. A separateness, frankly, that they've had a real tough time with through the centuries. But you're going to have to do it. <laughs> so this burden that he refers to, and when Peter recounts it, he talks, use the word yoke, yoke, burden, a pain in the kazoo. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was a big deal. We as 20th century people on this side of everything who don't even know what Jewishness is hardly, and they're just starting to get in touch with their Jewish roots, underestimate the difference between the Jew and the Gentile, not just superficially, but skin deep. So, what does James say? James says, the Gentiles, is prophesied, they're coming to God. Hallelujah. They're coming to God. Let's not make it tough on them. That's my judgment, he said, as the leader of the Jerusalem church. That's my judgment. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Let's just pause there. <laughs> what is he doing? What is this? Well, if you lived back in that time, and even if you lived in this time, if you were a Jew, you would understand these things. These are the, well, now it's fairly neatly codified and has been for several hundred years by the Jewish communities. These are the laws of Noah. They precede the Torah. Oh, yeah, in some ways they're repeated by the Torah. But these are the things essentially, now you won't find all of them listed out just this way um, in the Law of Moses, but basically... I mean, the law, uh, or after after the flood. But basically, in a, in a skeleton form, part or parcel, they're, they're here. And the Jews, in their mind, and I've said this before, they basically thought that a good Gentile, a righteous Gentile, there was such a thing as a righteous Gentile, there was. And it was somebody who was not an idolater, and it was somebody who did not join in cultic, well, frankly, Canaanite, especially, practices where your sexuality was involved in your worship. You, you, that was part of your, the ritual, actually. Um, or blood. Blood was also part of that worship. Um, and eating blood, drinking blood was all part of that. So there you got it. You've got, a, you've got some practices in the ancient world that were common to the Gentile nations, all of them in one way or another, that were often bundled together. They had to do with idolatry and demon worship. And they had to do with sexual practices that were part of that. And they had to do with blood. Because in the ancient world's mind, the soul was in the blood. 
and so yes that's what the good book even says the soul is in the blood but the jews were forbidden to drink blood to participate in such things there um, anyway that's another that's altogether a different topic but trust me these things if a gentile stayed clear of these things the rabbis in the first century and ever since have said they got a pretty good chance in the world to come mm -hmm. so jews don't feel any compulsion to convert gentiles now they'll but they'll point them to these things and they'll say you keep these things in fact if you want to find out more about that just look on the web and you could kind of trace some of the history of it where it was more formally codified but it's understood by Jews throughout the world. It's the seven laws of Noah. And here there's just, they're briefly mentioned in the forum, but they don't, they be thought of eventually. So, and then verse 21. Okay, now this is, this is, this has thrown some people. Because you, you sound like he's letting them off the hook. He's saying, you Gentiles don't have to worry about all this. Just us Jews. But then he says, for Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest time and is read in the synagogues. He is read, actually, is what it's, the Greek says, on every Sabbath. What's he saying there? Some have said, well, okay, you get cleaned up by faith in Jesus Christ and then you can go learn about the Jewish way in the synagogue. I kind of doubt that. I really do. Um, for one thing, the Jewish church in Jerusalem, anyway, has been thrown out of the synagogue. <laughs> and you know what trouble these Gentiles had? They were thrown out of the synagogues, as well as the believing Jews, wherever Paul last preached. The synagogue wasn't exactly safe territory. Not only that, but Christ never said anything about preaching Moses. Not explicitly. In fact, Paul says, we preach Christ over and over. John said this. Well, I'm getting off into another topic, but basically, you won't find the apostles being commissioned to preach Moses. So tongue-in-cheek, James is saying to those who are devout, who really are strong on keeping the Torah and doesn't and believes that it should really just be primarily for Jews, and if it's for Gentiles, they got to become Jews. Basically saying, okay, look, if they really want to become Jews, they still can. They can be saved, just like we've been. And they have sources of teaching elsewhere, in the synagogues, in every city. They want to become Jew and become equivalents to you guys, to us. If those Gentiles want to become a Jew, they can. But they don't have to be. <laughs> he was kind of putting this part of the leadership in their place saying, settle down. They still can. They still can. If it's so important. And if they want to, they can. So, verse 22. Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to divide this in the second half. Let's stop right there. We're going to read the letter piece by piece, that they wrote, because they wrote a letter. This letter is historic. This letter is the watershed. It's, it distills everything that they've decided on as a council and puts it in bite-sized form. They, you could say they tweeted it, <laughs> but it was a letter. And this is going to go out throughout the whole Christian world. And it's going to be looked back on throughout all time as a landmark decision of the early church. It's going to be fun to look at. Stick with me. In just a little while, we'll be back.